take it away, Cal and Cam. All right, thank you, Sam, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background to um, the previous projects, the Big Curator NLP project itself, um, you know, kind of the primary use cases and motivation for what we're doing. Uh, and then Cam is going to take over to talk a little bit more specifically about the software that both we've developed and continue to develop in the project. So just as a bit of background for those who aren't familiar, this grew out of the BitCurator project, which ran from uh, 2011 to 2014 in a couple phases, a partnership between SILS here at UNC and the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, also known as MYTH. And essentially the BitCurator goals were to uh, put together an environment that uh, took advantage of a lot of existing open source digital forensic software to enable a lot of different activities that collecting institutions wanted to engage in, such as creating disk images, ensuring an authentic chain of custody, um, identifying sensitive information, a variety of different things, um, and incorporate those into the workflows of libraries, archives, and museums in a way that the forensics industry itself wasn't really going to make a priority because we have different workflows. Um, and the other supporting uh, provision of public access to the data, which is something that's been an even more strong focus of our more recent projects. The Big Curator environment itself, if you're not familiar with it, basically bundles together a lot of different open source software into a uh, customized Linux environment. You can run it as your operating system on the machine or as an alternative in a separate partition, or you can run it as a virtual machine within something like VirtualBox. Um, and a lot of the different components in the environment can also just be run separately in whatever operating system you're using. The best place to find information about uh, installation use and functionality of the BitCurator environment is through the Quick Start Guide, which is available through the wiki. Uh, this is all being maintained and perpetuated through the BitCurator Consortium, which uh, Sam mentioned at the lead as uh, someone very strongly associated with the consortium. Um, and the BitCurator Consortium grew out of the original projects that were funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation uh, housed within Educopia Institute, which is a self-standing nonprofit organization, uh, but very much driven by the members in terms of priorities, in terms of what's going to happen next with the software, what kind of educational offerings are being offered like this webinar. Um, and you can find out more information about the consortium by going to bitcreatorconsortium.org. If you're not already familiar, I realize that many people on this webinar are represented by the institutions there. Uh, these are some uh, members of the consortium uh, at one of our events um, at the Wilson Library here at UNC. Um, and if you go to the website, you can see, I believe we now have 27 member institutions from four different countries. So it's a very active, dynamic community. And it's a really important background to everything we're talking about, right? Because this is the kind of the user base, the professional community around what we're going to be bringing to. The Big Creator environment itself essentially supports getting stuff off of disks, reporting on what's there, marking things that might need to be redacted, and export a variety of uh, types of metadata. And these things are all documented um, on the website, uh, both separately and in the quick start guide that I had just mentioned. So some of the functionality that people tend to uh, use pretty extensively is creation of disk images or a bit by bit copy of precisely what's on a disk. Uh, so Geimager is one of the tools that people often use to do that. This is a graphic user interface. Uh, that is relatively easy to use by simply selecting the disk image, whether you want it to be broken up into different parts, what metadata you want to assign to it, and then you run the, the, uh, the software. One of the reasons why this is important background to what Cam is going to be talking about is that though it's not required for all of the functionality we're going to be talking about, one of the use cases that we know we need to support with both BitCurator Access and BitCurator NLP is something is sitting on a disk image. Right? It's not just a set of files in a directory, it's a disk image. Um, so uh, there are a couple different ways to interact with a disk image. Traditionally, one is by mounting it. So you can run a script in the BitCurator environment that then just lets you navigate through the contents of a directory structure on a disk. Uh, the other is that you can use this BitCurator disk image access tool to drill down inside of the disk image see the contents and then make determinations of whether you want to export some of the files. Um, you might just want to view them to get a sense of, for example, in this view, you can see that uh, there are a number of deleted files. All the things with red name entries there are things that are still identified within the directory on the disk, but aren't necessarily still uh, present because they're not allocated within the file system. 
Another set of tools that people use quite extensively in the BitCurator environment are all wrapped up into bulk extractor. So bulk extractor is a set of scanners that run uh, in parallel to find potentially sensitive information on disks. What you're seeing here is the bulk extractor viewer, which is a graphic user interface that's on top of it. And those identifications of potentially sensitive information are based on offsets. So they're just going into the disk very quickly and identifying a spot on the disk where there might be something like GPS coordinates, a credit card number, a social security number. Uh, on top of that, there are a variety of tools that then pull information out of the file system. So that says what the timestamps are of the files, where they're sitting in the directory structure, generates hashes of each of the files so that you can identify them as distinct files. Uh, and then there's also a large set often of metadata that has a fairly flat structure but has these things called file objects and file objects are the XML metadata associated with every directory or file that's sitting on a drive so things like its timestamps what kind of file it is where it was sitting in the directory structure in this case you can see different uh, cryptographic hashes that have been generated for the files as well uh, the metadata associated with that output being DFXML, which is Digital Forensics XML, um, has a schema that's well documented online and you can see essentially what each of those elements mean. Uh, another part of this environment is generating premise event metadata, so metadata that indicates what has happened in the environment as somebody's been working through the process. Uh, if you're more interested in uh, those elements, you can see some of the output by running the tools or seeing the documentation online. And there are a variety of other specialized reports that are generated, things like how many of different types of files were found on the disk, a more aggregate summary of those bulk extractor scans. So, you know, how many instances of particular kinds of uh, personal identifying information were found. And there's just a lot of other functionality that's built into the environment that's been driven by uh, the user community who indicate, you know, we want to be able to deal with PST files because there's email in this collection. We want to be able to deal with the registry of a Windows machine so that we can identify configuration information and things like that. So essentially, when we've identified a need and can uh, then also identify open source software that's reliable and robust enough to, you know, work for people, we can then incorporate it into this open source environment. Um, and so you can see this fairly extensive list of these other tools that have been built into this environment. So that's essentially the background, right? That's what a lot of people run through before they potentially use the tools that we're now going to be talking about next. The Big Trader Access project that went for a couple years and, and finished in the fall of 2016, um, also, as with all these projects funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, focused, as the name implied, on access. So the Big Curator environment is essentially kind of a characterization, triage, initial processing sort of environment. Big Curator access has been an effort to develop software that can facilitate access to the data that then has been acquired from those media. So allowing people to navigate through a web browser, for example, to drill down into the content of a disk image, which we'll see a little bit later, uh, doing things like redaction of data that might need to be removed from a disk image, uh, we also did a work with the team uh, working on emulation as a service at the University of Freiburg to be able to do handoffs between an environment like the BitCurator platform that's creating disk images and an environment that allows people to access the content from those disk images using emulation. Uh, so one of the things that got generated from the BitCurator access pro project that I wanted to set out separately just because the rest of the development has fed um, directly into the BitCurator NLP tools that we're going to be talking about. A somewhat distinct but important product of the BitCurator Access Project was the redaction tools. So this allows you to, once you've identified either through some other mechanism or using Bulk Extractor, identified patterns of data on a disk that you want to get rid of, you can either scrub, fill, or fuzz. So scrub overwrites just with zeros, fill fills that stream of data with particular sequences of characters that you've identified, and fuzz is a particular functionality around if you have executable files on a disk that you want to distribute but you're concerned about having the rights to distribute the software itself you, you can fuzz out those executable files so that they can't run essentially. so having completed those projects we then engaged in BitCurator nlp which is the context of the current webinar it's also funded by the andrew w mellon foundation will end in september of this year 
and we're developing software for collecting institutions to extract, analyze, and produce reports on various features within digital materials that take advantage of existing natural language processing tools. So the primary things we're going to be talking to you about today are named entity recognition, identifying things like people, places, and organizations, and also topic modeling. So identifying clusters of associations between words within disks that might be, or directories of files, that might be indicative of something that you wouldn't have found with just full text search. A little bit more framing to this is to point out the challenge of diverse archival collections. If you look to the literature on natural language processing, if you see people present at conferences related to natural language processing, the foundation tends to be very cleaned up, very consistent data sets. The reason that you can demonstrate really high reliability in summarizing news stories or something like that is that the, the input into that software is generally very, very consistent, cleaned up, and structured in a formal way. Um, I'm sure you would agree with me that in archival collections, we don't have that liberty. You have all kinds of different things in different file systems of different file types. And so what we've really aimed for from the beginning of this project is the good enough solutions that will help people, either as somebody who's working in the archive to process the materials, characterize them, support appraisal, or somebody who's an end user who's trying to do further inquiry and get meaningful information out of the collections, to recognize that having a perfect NLP solution essentially requires a great deal of training that software to that specific type of data set, which we don't really have much liberty to do in an archival setting because every new acquisition that comes along, they have own activities. So we've really aimed very much for what can we do that will advance these efforts without dwelling on the fact that they're always going to be a small number of false negatives or positives. So this is essentially the use case overview, right? Finding relevant features in open text, that's an important qualifier for what Cam's going to be talking about, which is that none of these tools can work if you don't have a stream of text that's been fed out of a file. So part of this work is simply running tools that can pull readable text out of files of whatever type they are, then using existing open source software to identify and report on these different types of natural language uh, components, whether they're named entities or concepts that have been identified through topic modeling. Uh, so next I'm going to hand over to Cam, who's going to talk a little bit more about the tool sets that are in development and available and what our future priorities are as well. So hi, everyone. Uh, give us uh, just a second to switch over screens and get our uh, audio spot. Sorry about that. We've got several different machines here. So um, let me move over to the other screen share here. Uh, Sam, can you remove the existing screen share? Uh, I think it's up to Cal to stop sharing his screen. Okay. We'll give it just a second then. But I can overwrite him, I guess. Hold on. Mm, no. Uh, give us just a second. All right, great. Give me just a second here. Great, so you're gonna see me uh, swap between several different views on this desktop. Uh, so uh, hopefully everyone can uh, uh, see 
exactly what I'm sharing. Sam, if it uh, if it does seem to get out of sync, just uh, just cut in and let me know. Will do. Great. Uh, so, so as Cal mentioned, uh, the rest of this uh, presentation is is mostly on the uh, on the tools that we've been developing for the current uh, generation of the project, um, and because of some of those uh, factors that Cal mentioned, there tends to be kind of bleed over between the development. So, uh, between BitGrader Access and BitGrader LP, there's been kind of some merging of uh, the functionality of some of these tool sets as they support uh, you know, multiple different use cases. Uh, so the first tool set I'll talk about and that many of you have probably heard about before is this uh, BitCreator Access Web Tools. Uh, this was a tool we started development on uh, a number of years ago to provide uh, file system browsing access for disk images on the web. Um, over the over the years we've been refining uh, this tool and with the help of the uh, Open Preservation Foundation We've done a, a fairly major refactor on the uh, on the functionality of this tool to allow it to process very large uh, disk collections uh, very reliably uh, and allow you to browse the file systems, download file elements, and most recently do full text extraction from the uh, from sort of heterogeneous file types. Uh, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. But the goal here uh, is ultimately to provide uh, sort of uh, in-browser rendering of uh, entities and other interesting features that are found uh, in, in extracted full text from collections found in disk images, uh, both, uh, both as sort of an assessment tool for materials like disk images that might be, uh, 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 you know, prior to them being processed into, into, the, into collections or, as, uh, or, or, or for access support. So the second, uh, the second tool set I'll talk about, and again, um, if, if anybody here saw or uh, followed along some uh, the NLP for ARC event that we had a few months back, um, this is going to track uh, many of the topics I touched on there uh, and with some discussion of some of our more recent development. Uh, so the second tool set I'll talk about is the topic modeling for disk images, disk image contents. Uh, and the the names in parens here are just the names of the the GitHub repositories where these tools are stored. If you'd like to go look at them under our uh, BitCreator uh, organization name on GitHub, uh, this is a tool set that automates file extraction, text extraction, and various types of post processing. Uh, again, on on disk images or disk image collections, uh, uh, uses a tool set called Textract to do uh, full text extraction and then presents a topic model visualization uh, currently using uh, a, a tool set developed by another research group called PyLDA Biz uh, and, uh, and uh, with a an, uh, web interface provided by GraphLab and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then finally, we've been working on another set of, uh, of uh, sort of slightly lower level tools for entity identification and reporting on, on file collections. So these are independent of disk images, uh, but they're a set of tools that uh, can be pointed at, again, at large heterogeneous file collections with a full, te full text extraction that can be used to produce machine readable, machine readable reports on, uh, on the contents of those, uh, of those collections, including uh, various entities, entity spans, uh, other parts of speech, and so on. This is, a, this is an in-development tool. I've included a link to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, GitHub repo at the bottom here. It's not quite as far along as the as the other as the other two tool sets. So keep that in mind if you go uh, take a look at that. But I'll show you some uh, some screenshots from how it operates today. <clears throat> and my keyboard isn't working. All right. So first off, uh, BitCreator Access Web Tools. So as I mentioned, uh, as many of you have seen this uh, tool set before. For uh, the sort of core approach we've taken for text analysis in this tool set is uh, by building test corpora, essentially to simulate uh, a, a wide range of disk image collections in, in archives and libraries. So we try to build these tools uh, to be sort of independent of um, <clears throat> file format concerns as much as possible. So <clears throat> ideally, we'd like to build um, integrated, uh, integrated processing uh, tool stacks that, that allow you to uh, sort of processes as many different kinds of file formats as possible. 
So the idea is here, you might have many different file types, you might have limited metadata on them. Uh, and, and for that, uh, for those test cases, we've simply pulled these, uh, these document collections out of things like Gutenberg, uh, which are largely just text-based, and then GovDocs1, which is a crawl of .gov that includes a wide range of modern and legacy uh, document formats, <clears throat> document formats, image formats, PowerPoint databases, and so on. Again, most of these text extraction tools are going to focus largely on, on, document, uh, uh, on document formats. Um, we've tuned this tool set to extract text from several dozen extremely common formats. So we're just kind of disregarding the long tail in, our, in, in the basic tune for this tool. Um, there is no single tool that's appropriate for this task. We've, we've, you know, we've looked into a, a wide range of tools, and there are some that, that, that work very well, uh, but have limitations when you point them at, say, legacy file formats and so on. So uh, we're using something called Textract. That's essentially a wrapper <clears throat> uh, around uh, a variety of existing uh, mature tools to do text extraction from, uh, from these document types. And you can see a list of that over on the side here. You can read about that project uh, down at the bottom. I've included the link. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit here. Uh, and then finally, we have some engineering constraints. We want to scale up and down with the size of the collection. So, uh, so we've we've built this tool in such a way that if you point it at a very small collection, um, the, the the interface doesn't look uh, um, curious. And if you point it at very large collections, it it, uh, it it reports back reasonably on how long it's going to take to process that uh, that data. Um, so the core approach in, in most of these tools is we're using Spacey uh, I.O. for entity, entity recognition and other base, basic text analytics. Um, the reason we chose uh, Spacey is it's a, it's a, it's a mature uh, NLP processing tool set that's geared towards development, it's high performance, has a relatively simple API, uh, it integrates with a variety of other machine learning platforms, and it fits nicely into our, uh, into our full Python stack. So, um, you know, we try to keep these uh, these tool sets as as simple as possible in terms of the build stacks. You know, the, there's a lot of complexity in 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 trying to get from disk images or uh, 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 forensically packaged disk images, uh, you know, all the way through kind of nicely presented text uh, text output from a variety of file formats. So. Uh, so we have this stack that you can sort of deploy on any platform that that can that supports this Python stack, and uh, and the basic use case is just kind of text goes in or disk images go in and entity spans come out. This is what the current uh, iteration of this tool set looks like. So uh, you can actually visit this uh, URL uh, uh, up at the top here, dogwood.ils.unc.edu colon eighty eighty. This is a uh, this is a version of that tool set running in the uh, in a VM, and it's missing a few of the features that I'll, I'll talk about here, but I'll, I'll, I'll return to that in a second. Um, so the basic interface that comes up is uh, when you when you download and set up this tool, there's a there's a uh, 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 there's a configuration file that you can point at sets of uh, sets of disk images, locations of disk images, either local to your machine or in a shared drive, uh, anywhere really, and it'll uh, it'll recursively reprocess all of those uh, all of those directories to find the disk images, and there's a simple metadata setup that uh, that that lets you uh, that lets you assign some uh, uh, names and and descriptions to those groups. Uh, these disk images are all processed uh, uh, live in the inter uh, live through the interface uh, when you when you interact with it. So there's no pre-processing of these disk images. When you click on an individual collection, it reads the contents of the metadata associated, and I'm using the word collection loosely here, small c, just a collection of disk images. Uh, it, repro or it, it processes the contents of that collection, pulls out metadata associated with those disk images. And when you click on an individual image, it shows you the, uh, the partitions associated with that image. Drilling down into our part a partition uh, will show you a file system style hierarchical view of the contents of that file and or concept contents of that partition and 
Uh, and when you drill down to an individual file, uh, sorry, on this previous page, there, there are download links for the individual files, but for any file that, uh, that can actually be processed with Textract, you will get raw text uh, pulled out into another page that will uh, provide you some additional file, uh, file details and uh, then uh, UTF-8 encoded uh, raw text pulled out, or sorry, UTF-8 encoded text pulled out from uh, the file as, as as best as the uh, as best as the toolkit could do it. So in this case, uh, it's the PDF it's a PDF file where um, where TextDrag has pulled out uh, all the raw text. It's got some control characters here as well. Uh, generally, it does a, a reasonable job uh, for additional text processing. In the uh, in upcoming versions of this tool set, we will be using. Uh, Text is, or uh, sorry, we will be using uh, a plugin for Spacey that allows you to uh, generate uh, HTML tag spans for the individual uh, the individual entities that are encountered with within this disk image. Um, we have this code uh, already in the uh, repo. It's not turned on for the interface yet, uh, but that'll be coming in in the next couple of months. Um, so the idea here is uh, you'll be able to click on these files, see the contents of uh, the text that's extracted, see the common entities that are <clears throat> identified by Spacey, <clears throat> and <clears throat> sorry, and we're not aiming for uh, we're not aiming for perfection here. So this is uh, this is essentially uh, an access and uh, and scanning tool for. Uh, for uh, a user, whether it's uh, someone who's coming into access a, a collection or <clears throat> someone who's doing pre-processing uh, on the contents. So we'll tolerate some noise. You can see here, um, there's an organization that was incorrectly tagged. It's not an organization. Uh, and it does make some other errors like these. These models are retrainable, uh, but the default models uh, for both English and other common languages, you can find those on, on Spacey's site. Um, can be applied to a, a fairly wide range of, uh, of uh, genres of material. Um, so the other, uh, the other benefit of uh, processing the information this way is that once you've identified entities within the collection like this, uh, you can be you can you can use the full text index which. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned that earlier, but uh, the uh, BitCreator Access Web Tools actually generates a full text index for all of the contents that it extracts uh, automatically. Uh, when you first bring the application up, it'll just continue processing that in the background until it's done. Um, uh, so once you've, once you've found a file that has a particular entity in it, if you, uh, if you identify, say, someone, a person in this case, Elizabeth Scott, and you go to the search interface, in the <clears throat> in the actual BCA Web Tools uh, uh, application, it will pull up all of the other files within that disk image collection that uh, it has identified uh, extracted text that contains that entity in. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have just that one file. Uh, it's showing you the hash and some other metadata. Um, we've tested this on several uh, uh, sample sets from from the GovDocs and um, there are, uh, we have some other output for these collections as well that shows you kind of uh, what these entity distributions look like. Um, again, there is some noise in these uh, in in this output, but uh, but this is not uh, this is not uh, this isn't intended to be research grade data. It's supposed to intended it's it, it's intended to sort of assist in the in the access on the access side of things. Uh, you can find the source code for this on on GitHub. Uh, there's a uh, there's a build stack that's fairly simple to use that will automatically deploy a virtual box virtual machine uh, that can sit uh, on another host, uh, can uh, route traffic over the network and so on. Uh, and you can play, the, uh, play around with this uh, on your own laptop as well. So this will build on a, on a regular uh, sort of laptop uh, speed device. Uh, we have again these some of these additional NLP features coming in the next few months, and uh, and there's some additional documentation on the uh, on the BitCreator Access Wiki that has now been split off from uh, wiki.bitcreator.net. You can still get there if by going to wiki.bitcreator.net. There's a link out for the uh, BitCreator Access 
uh, dedicated wiki. Um, and again, uh, I, I do have this tool up, I believe, uh, here. So just to show you some of the, uh, just to show you some of the, uh, some of that working on a live server right now. If I click on all images and go to one of these images, here's, a good, here's the Gutenberg sampler. This just has a bunch of text files in it. Click on one of these text files to see. Um, again, this is all uh, this is all being this is all being processed live by the system. Nothing is pre-processed, so you can actually point this at very very large collections of, of images and uh, uh, and uh, build indexes of the extracted text and uh, and uh, uh, and interact with them very quickly. Okay, the, the second tool set I'm going to talk about is uh, the, our topic modeling tools. This is a, uh, this is a, a new tool set that's being developed as part of this, uh, part of the Decorator NLP project. And the approach for this tool set was to kind of provide a simple, simplified path for useful analysis of, <clears throat> of topic models uh, generated from disk image contents. Uh, so topic modeling tools themselves have become uh, much simpler to use. There are, uh, there are a wide range of uh, relatively um, straightforward APIs in, in, in application or in, sorry, in tool sets like uh, uh, Spacey and Jensen and others, uh, uh, the, the mallet tool set used by Arc Extract. Uh, but much of the sort of dirty work, the, 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 the complicated work to clean up these data sets is in the pre-processing. And this is, again, compounded when you're working with complex digital objects. Um, so to, to build a tool set that, where you can feed in disk images rather than individual collections of files or uh, subsets of files when the in those disk images requires some additional engineering effort. Um, so to encapsulate this workflow, um, we've tried to elide as much of that the, the, those dependencies from the user as possible. So when you bring up this tool, uh, <clears throat> similar to Big Creator NLP, oh, sorry, similar to Big Creator Access Web Tools, you can point it at a uh, collection of, or, or sorry, at a directory containing a set of disk images, and it will automatically uh, it will automatically extract the contents, extract the text from the individual files found within those disk images, uh, and uh, build this web front end that allows you to uh, sort of explore uh, both the topic distributions across those models, uh, sorry, across those disk images and across those uh, files within them. So again, the, the simple version of this is disks go in, topic, topics and topic clusters come out. Um, again, we've used the Python library stack for doing this topic modeling. Um, <clears throat> right now, we've been using uh, a, a toolkit called GraphLab. Commercial toolkit for the uh, for machine learning. We we also have a fully open source version of this uh, GenSim that can be plugged in. But if you go uh, if you go download the the toolkit right now, you'll find that the, that the, uh, GraphLab is currently turned on. Um, it does a variety of text preprocessing, so word stemming, removing stop words, and so on. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and it can efficiently process a large large amounts of data. Uh, larger than you could you could keep in main memory. So so I, I, again, this is this is a toolkit that's sort of geared towards allowing you to pro, pre, or process and visualize very large collections without without uh, requiring you to be running on really heavy duty hardware. Uh, for the front end visualization on this tool, we're using PyLDA Viz, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a product of another research team that uh, that is it's it's uh, simply an interactive visualization tool for topic modeling. Uh, it runs uh, latent directly uh, uh, analysis over uh, the data set and invokes this uh, this PyLD, uh, PyLD Avis GUI that I'll show you in a minute. Um, so the tools, the full tool stack looks like this. Uh, you treat the disk images as sets of corpora. Sorry, you treat the disk image sets uh, as corpora. Um, you um, uh, again, there are the the issues you can run into with these kinds of collections is that you may have limited context for for what's inside those images, for what's inside the individual files, and the goal here is to provide uh, fast paths towards understanding what it is uh, the the sort of major genres or points of interest within these uh, these collections of of disk images might be. 
uh, where the, the process here kind of simplifies the extraction and analyzing of those materials. As I mentioned earlier, we automate all of the uh, text extraction from heterogeneous file types. Uh, and, uh, and we've relied on sort of this existing uh, robust visualization tool to uh, to uh, to display that data. We also produce uh, the the toolkit that we generate now also produces kind of raw text reporting output that I can, can show you in a in a little bit as well. So there there are other options beyond these uh, these interactive visualizations for working with this data. Uh, and I've I've talked about this uh, I've talked about this stack again. Um, this is this is a this is a pure Python stack. Uh, again, we use TextTrack for text extraction uh, rather than something like TKS since this is, there's no Java in this stack. Um, this is what the this is what the sort of output looks like when you actually run this against a set of disk images, and you can see a few things here. There are um, there, there's a there's a sort of dimensionally reduced map over here on the left of all of the uh, all of the sorry the the ten most common topics or the ten most salient topics that were uh, identified in this collection, and those clusters, uh, those clusters indicate uh, topic similarity. So up here, uh, the selected topic uh, number six, you can see this, um, the the terms that are associated with this topic, uh, and the again the uh, the the red bars over here on the right are sort of term frequency within the selected topic versus the overall term frequency in the uh, in the collection. So you can get a sort of a visual sense of uh, of how likely those uh, those terms are to reflect uh, the contents you might see elsewhere in the collection. Um, the indication here is that these two topics, six and ten, are quite similar. If we switch to another uh, topic that's uh, somewhat further from the rest of the group, you can see uh, indeed the uh, the the uh, sorry the term uh, distribution for this uh, for this topic is is quite different. It's this appears to be something about cooking. Uh, the source code for this tool set is uh, is also on GitHub. You can find it under bitcrater uh, slash bitcrater NLP gen TM. Uh, this tool set currently needs to be built inside a dedicated VM due to some limitations of how uh, uh, of how GraphLab displays its data, but we'll be working on uh, improving that in the future as well. Um, and then finally, uh, we have a set of tools for entity extraction and reporting tools. This is a tool set that we started working on uh, at the beginning of the project and uh, shifted away from for a while to to focus on our uh, to focus on our work improving uh, access web tools and the and the topic model generation tools. Uh, we're returning to this now and hoping to have uh, improved versions of this available over the next couple of months as well. So this is a. a uh, <clears throat> This is a tool set that basically extracts and reports on custom entity sets from, uh, again, uh, heterogeneous document types. So uh, this does not operate on disk images. This requires you to have the disk image mounted or to just simply have a, a directory of files. Uh, this will scan through that directory of files, identify uh, file types that are, uh, that are likely to be high quality candidates for automated text extraction with text to see. So again, this would be text files, PDFs, HTMLs, uh, doc files, uh, uh, Excel files, and so on. Uh, you can find the full list on on the text to uh, uh, uh site, and do uh, sort of targeted NAD identification based on that collection. So again, we use uh, we use the Spacey platform for uh, for entity identification. Uh, it's it does uh, it does a very uh, quick job of of doing this. One pointed at uh, uh, when pointed at raw text, uh, it has a pre-trained model that's trained over uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of, of, of disk images. Uh, the English, we found that the English language model is, um, it's a, the, the results you get are a little bit dirty, but they, uh, but they, again, they're, they're, they're often useful for, uh, they're often useful for uh, sort of fast search of these collections to identify documents that might uh, have, say, similar named entities within them. Um, you will see in some of the examples uh, look at here, you'll see things that don't necessarily look like entities. So this, this, the way this, uh, this uh, tool set is tuned, it considers things like numerics and dates and, thing, and, and so on. 
uh, entities as well. And you can you can actually find a full description of what the different entity categories for Spacey are on the Spacey site as well. We have them just all turned on here. So. Um, uh, again, uh, we've tried to encapsulate the workflow as, uh, as much as possible here. This tool set runs completely inside a, uh, a Conda, uh, an Anaconda virtual environment. So uh, there are instructions on the, in, the, uh, in the GitHub that tell you how to, uh, how to set up uh, Conda and install all of the dependent tools for this. Uh, and the, the nice thing about that is that that's actually multi-platform, so you can run that on a Windows machine, a Mac, or anything else. Uh, we have an experimental curses-based front end to, to, to assist in generating the reports, uh, and that needs some work, but uh, that, that's coming again in the next few weeks. So uh, again, this is sort of what the output looks like. Uh, this is one of the uh, this is one of the documents from that collection I was showing you. So this is a PDF of someone's presentation on uh, on uh, DOE waste immobilization. Um, so there's a lot of technical and scientific information in here. Pointing this tool at that uh, uh, pulls out uh, a range of entities that uh, that might be useful in tracking this document against other similar documents within that collection. Again, this is this was pulled from uh, from GovDocs. So in this case, you've got the original uh, document sample. Uh, the the tool uh, over here uh, has a, this very sort of simple uh, uh, curses interface that lets you enter a document index for all of the documents that you pre-processed. Uh, it'll pull the text out for that and that, and then show you the uh, the uh, ID of that. Uh, entity, the um, uh, the, the uh, UTF encoded name for that entity, uh, and the spans, and the spans are turned off in this one, but uh, those will again be uh, updated in a, in a future version. So this is a tool that will essentially allow you to generate, uh, you know, large amounts of machine readable output that can then be uh, post-processed to produce, uh, uh, to produce uh, other types of um, uh, uh, entity reports for, for arbitrary document collections. Uh, again, uh, this is also uh, in our uh, in our repos on GitHub. Um, that that toolset is still heavily under that last toolset I was mentioned. I was showing you there is still uh, heavily in development, uh, but the other two uh, should be uh, should be fairly stable right now. Uh, you can also find an overview of all of our projects on bigcrater.github.io if you go to our uh, source repository and. Uh, get confused about what's associated with what because there's a lot of things there. So, yeah. So, um, so we have about 15 minutes left, and I think we have some time for questions. Yeah. Thanks, Cam, and and thanks, Cal, for the the intro and the context. Um, having seen a lot of this stuff for the first time myself, I think I think you guys have been doing some really great work. Uh, really exciting directions for exposing um, text from collections and being able to improve and, and make better decisions in archival workflows. Um, yeah, just, just want to throw my thoughts in there. But I uh, want to open it up now for, for anyone else uh, to ask questions. Feel free to, to unmute um, and or uh, throw, throw a question into the chat box, um, and we can uh, relay it from there. So, any questions or thoughts? Hi, Hi this is Farrell. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yep. Um, this is a question for, I guess, for Cam. Um, in that end span uh, demo you were showing, is there a way to filter by entity type? So, if we were interested in getting all the, the person names out so we could pass it to some uh, database to see what what their affiliation with the university might be. Um, is that possible to do, or is it just kind of a dump of all of the entities, uh, regardless of type? So, <clears throat> so right now that tool uh, basically, if it's, it, so, it's it, the, the setup for that tool is very manual right now, and it actually requires you to manually create a Postgres database that's associated with the. Uh, with the, with running it against a, a particular collection, so everything is stored in the Postgres database, and that can be queried for uh, for uh, whatever information you're looking at. And in fact, that is how those reports are produced. They are just uh, they are uh, once the once the entities and the or sorry 
once the text is extracted, the entities are extracted, all that information is put into a structured Postgres database. Um, I don't think the uh, I don't think the table actually includes the spacey type right now, but that's trivial to add. And uh, at that point, uh, producing a report that was filtered by any entity type would also just simply be a query to that database. Um, gotcha. Yeah, we're 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 revising that uh, the uh, we're revi sorry we're revising the uh, the interface and the uh, the front end tools for that right now. Um, there there are still actually quite a few things broken in it. So. Um, but uh, but the code is not particularly complex, so um, it, you know you should send me a reminder if that's uh, if that's a particular sort of flag you want for uh, for the for the front end on that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Other questions or feedback for Callan Cam? Have any folks on the call already been looking into other natural language processing type tools for for their collections, or is this sort of the the first sort of encounter with looking at the I guess the uh, application of these kinds of tools for archival collections? Oh, question in the chat. Super. Uh, what's the future direction of your projects? That's for, I guess, either Cal or Cam. Okay, so there was the question about the future direction. Um, I think there are two ways to answer that. One is some of the things that Cam already hinted at about you know future development within just the context of this project before fall. Um, after that, there are a number of possible directions. One of the things we've been discussing is um, further work towards uh, software to, um, to facilitate uh, appraisal decision making. So for example, things that are more Kind of real-time interaction where you can make decisions based on okay what if i excluded all the you know files that had this entity that appeared in them what would the collection look like then or you know things that help that kind of decision making because a lot of a lot of what each of these tools comes up with even though it's interactive in the sense that you can click around it's relatively static and that you're not shaping the nature of the data you're looking at as you're interacting with it um another very likely direction, I should say uh, promising, not necessarily likely, <laughs> um, would be along the lines of machine learning and actually improving a lot of these kinds of tools um, based on specific types of data. Um, the caveat that I threw out at the very beginning of the NLP summary is really important there, though, that there's this question of how much time and resources can realistically be devoted to materials when different acquisitions are different right so trying to determine essentially how to improve tools like this so that they get better at dealing with archival collections when the archival collections themselves might vary dramatically so if you're in an institutional record setting and you know that you're going to get records of particular predefined series over years it could make a lot more sense to really train the software to recognize things that fall into those categories um, as opposed to a sort of you know more traditional manuscripts kind of setting where every acquisition you get comes out of a completely different organizational context, uh, completely different naming conventions. Um, those are more just possible future directions of where all the software might go. Those are not things within the scope of the project itself. I don't know if Cam, you wanted to say anything more than you already did about plans for the software. Um, I don't know, I don't know if that gets to the question. Um, I, I will say that each one of our projects has been very driven by what we've heard directly from members of the use community for what would be most useful to them. So we're always very open to feedback on what would be the most important next directions to support the work you're trying to do. So essentially, I guess that summary is things that are more kind of interactive interface sort of work, and the other is more, you know, getting getting the models and the um, and the accuracy higher by actually using other kinds of technologies like machine learning. Um, neither of which are, you know, grants that we're currently engaged in, but certainly could be future projects. Yeah, 
Any other questions? And, and I will say also in terms of future directions is that as I said very early on, this webinar is happening within the context of the Big Curator Consortium. Um, the work that we do at UNC is sort of the, you know, the research development arm of all of this stuff. We're not really the ones that sustain any of this. <laughs> um, and so a lot of questions about the future trajectory of software itself, you know, how much it should be a priority, how much it should be, um, you know, supported and related to the other um, resources that are uh, part of the consortium scope really is going to be defined by the members of the consortium itself. You know, if this this sort of trajectory is a very high interest priority of the members, that answer is going to be very different from, you know, if it's not, and there's just much more focus on the core functionality of the big greater environment itself. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just follow on to that to say that um, the the kinds of conversations that that go on in the the big curator consortium are are very much a, around you know defining needs and use cases and um, making decisions about workflows so it's a lot of the sort of you know the high level sort of practical activities um, but that is very much the space where uh, you know software requirements uh, start to get you know sort of early stages of defining what what practitioners are really needing to do their work better uh, in the context of, of born digital materials um, so uh, yeah the you know it, it the conversations go go beyond that but it's it's really you know it's i would say one of the premier uh, communities for really engaging uh, in these kinds of in kinds of questions um, and and then you know making the kinds of uh, uh, plans <coughs> and decisions for for how to pursue some kind of technological development to attempt to, to solve or resolve some of some of those issues and, and needs um, so yeah, in my role as community facilitator, I would just I would just encourage uh, those of you on the call uh, who are not currently members definitely check out all the resources that that Cal and Cam have presented today, but also just take a look at at BCC membership. Um, it's really it's the way that we're able to keep uh, keep the software alive, but also uh, keep growing the community in the directions that the, the members want to see see it go. Um, so just you know, consider consider that as an option for for your institution as a way to to get more involved and really play a play a uh, I have an opportunity for a bigger role in, in steering that direction. Um, so that little plug said, um, any other questions or comments before before we close today? Okay, great. Well, um, Cal and Cam are always available uh, for for um, comments and questions. You can also get in touch with me. I'll be following up with a quick little webinar survey to all those that attended. Um, so thank you, Cal and Cam, again for your time today. Uh, really great presentation overview, and uh, thanks to all of you for for coming. Hope everyone has a good Friday afternoon and and weekend as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a good weekend. Take care, all. Bye, everyone.